Hello, everyone. OK. Thank you, Ricky, for such a beautiful introduction. I am here to give the introduction to for Kimberly. Kimberly Dowdell is a force to beckon with. When we were told as student for, for class day representations, I was so excited because I had finally seen the news. I was in Chicago at the Chicago AIA conference when you got elected, and I was really happy as a fellow black woman myself to see such a face in the thing. She's just not an, she's not just an architect, but a passionate advocate for diversity, sustainability, and the future of our cities. Kimberly's deep-rooted connection to her hometown of Detroit has shaped her career aspirations. She was inspired to use architecture as a powerful tool to revitalize cities. Drawing from her experiences growing up in the mother city, her educational journey took her to Cornell University, where she has ended where she earned her Bachelor of Architecture degree and at Harvard University, where she earned her Master of Public Administration. Throughout her professional life, Kimberly has explored various realms, including architecture, government, and teaching, and real estate development, which is fun. As the, NOMA, as the national president of the National Organization of Minority Architects from 2019 to 2020, Kimberly worked tirelessly alongside her board of directors and staff to create a greater to create greater opportunities for women and people of color within the building professions. Under her leadership, NOMER's membership more than doubled. I was one of them. <laughs> and the organization's influence and visibility skyrocketed, which was really fun to see. She currently serves as a principal in the Chicago studio of HOK. At this renowned global design firm, she has co-founded the Seed Network in 2005, became lead accredited professional in 2007. Okay. There's a lot of achievements here, so I'm going to read it slowly <laughs> so we all process this. Her outstanding contributions to the field have been recognized through prestigious awards, such as being named the AIA Young Architect of the Year awardee and architectural record on women architecture in recipient in 2020. Additionally, Crane's Detroit Business and Crane's Chicago Business honored Kimberly as 40 Under 40 awardee in 2018 and 2020 respectively. Her alma mater, Crane Brook Kingswood, also bestowed on her the Distinguished Alumni Award. As I started, Kimberly is a force, as you can see. Her dedication and impact have ended in place on Cornell University's Board of Trustees and the AIA Board of Directors as its 2023 president-elect. In 2004, she will make history as the 100th national president of the AIA and the first black woman to hold this prestigious position. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> Which inspires me as a fellow black woman. She is bound with a clear mission to improve people's lives through design. Her journey is an inspiring testament to me and to all other people here as well. And it is with great honor and admiration I introduce her to give the class day speech. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to be here. And before I get started with my remarks, I actually just want to take a moment to, uh, to acknowledge the parents and the family members and the, fa and the friends that are here that have supported our graduates. Can we just give them a round of applause? Okay. So I know I'm standing in between you and the reception, so I'm going to get through my remarks fairly, fairly quickly here. But again, my name is Kimberly Dowdell. It's a delight to be here. Thank you to the Harvard Graduate School of Design for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Dean Whiting. Welcome to the world ahead is the title of my whole speech. You can read it, re you can read it later, but I'll, I'll read it for you here now. So dear graduates, dear fellow designers, dear authors of the future, I welcome you to the world. Not just the world as we are experiencing it today, but I welcome you to the world ahead. The world that you, our graduates, will help create. As we learned from the global pandemic that turned our world upside down just three years ago, the way things are can change in almost an instant. What we know today is that we cannot foresee the future. But I really want to impress upon you the notion that we can leverage the power of design to create it, the future. As you begin, as you begin your post-Gund Hall journey with a freshly minted degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Design, I challenge you 
to foresee the future. Now, I realize I literally just said that you can't foresee the future, but if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to share a different definition of foresee with you. That is four very important words that not only start with the letter C, but words that have also defined the course of my career. These four words are curiosity, creativity, courage, and consistency. For the time that I have with you today, I'd like to walk you through my journey from an 11-year-old kid growing up in the heart of Detroit to a now 39-year-old president-elect of the American Institute of Architects. That is, as was mentioned, the first black woman to serve in this role since the Institute was founded in 1857. So let me start from the beginning. In an upbringing characterized by a delicate mix of challenge and triumph, I decided very early on in life that I wanted to become a doctor so that I could help the many people I witnessed suffering around me. At a certain point, I realized that it wasn't just the people that showed visible signs of distress. It was the buildings around me, it was the buildings around me that did as well. It was in a middle school art class that I learned about the possibility of becoming an architect. Soon thereafter, I had an epiphany moment while observing an old abandoned department store in downtown Detroit. It was called the Hudson's Department Store. I decided that I wanted to restore that building and others like it in an effort to restore the health and vitality of the people in my city, on my block, and within my home. This is where my curiosity came into play. The kid version of me in 1994 simply asked, why does my city look and feel like this, and what can I do to help it heal? That was the question. My creative solution uh, was to abandon my ambition to become a doctor to instead, pursue, to, to instead pursue a career in architecture. I would endeavor to design the future that I wished to see in Detroit. My courage needed to kick in when I realized that I'm 11 years old and I've never even met an architect. Little did I know that actually becoming a licensed architect would take me another 20 years, but it's fine. Um, because of course I happened to choose one of the most involved and rig rigorous professions that exists. Uh, spoiler alert, I went for it with full force and it worked out okay. Um, but that brings me to my fourth C, consistency. Because architecture and design generally is not for the faint of heart, it was really important for me to show up, learn, do the work, iterate on the work, take the criticism, which we all know well here in design school, keep showing up and consistently overcome challenge after challenge after challenge. I'm sure you know by now, learning how to design and critically think about the future is no easy task. That is why consistently showing up is so important. Consistency is crucial to the design process, a process that you will no doubt embark upon in the journey ahead of you. Embrace it fully. You are sitting here right now because you are ready. So I started with a story from 1994. I learned recently that some younger people refer, that, refer to that era of time as the late 1900s, which I think is <laughs> fascinating, but it's neither here nor there. Uh, let me now move into the early 2000s uh, to bring this more up to date. Uh, it was in, 2000, in 2005 when I was embarking upon my fifth and final year of architecture school at Cornell. Uh, that summer, I read a magazine article that literally changed the trajectory of my career. The article was featured in Metropolis Magazine, and it was entitled The Ethics of Brick, written by Lance Hosey. He wrote eloquently about the triple bottom line that is social, economic, and environmental. This article sparked my, again, curiosity. It made me question why there's so much new emphasis on environmental sustainability where I was working at the time, which was the General Services, as, bleh, General Services Administration in the Office of the Chief Architect. Say that five times fast. Um, but there was very little conversation about the social impact of the federal government's work on communities. Coming from Detroit with, this, with the perspective that I brought to the table, I could not separate the social from the economic 
and the environmental. I understood that they were all inextricably linked together. My curiosity inspired me to ask, how can we bring the social impact of design projects to the forefront? My creativity helped me to develop a solution which was to establish a counterpart to the lead rating system for buildings that evaluates how projects perform from a social impact perspective. I was so excited about this idea that I almost immediately found my supervisor, uh, Mr. Steve Lewis, and told him with bold courage that we need to have the GSA create seed to help, which cause it rhymes with lead, obviously, um, to help the federal government improve social outcomes for future building projects. From that initial conversation blossomed, pun intended, the seed network, which has a mission to advance the right of every person to live in a socially, economically, and environmentally healthy community. I have consistently worked toward this mission throughout my professional career. A few years later in 2010, I was giving a presentation about the SEED network to my colleagues at HOK when that sparked a conversation about what we were doing as a global design firm in each of our respective communities. As a small group of us, then young architects, we were curious, again, another C word, curious about what we could do to formalize and amplify the many community service efforts that were already happening throughout HOK's network of design studios. From those initial conversations, we created the concept behind what is now known as HOK Impact. Officially launched in 2011, a multi-studio coalition of young designers had the courage to request the support and financial backing of HOK's leadership to establish one of our industry's very first corporate social responsibility programs. I was actually on a firm white HOK Impact call just yesterday, and I was so proud to see this next generation of designers take on the work more than a decade later. That is consistency. Now I'll tell one final story from 2020 uh, when I was serving as the 2019-2020 president of NOMA. The date was May 30th. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had just finished watching uh, virtual church that Sunday morning and I felt this sense of urgency to write a letter to the NOMA membership and my profession at large. My curiosity or the question I asked myself in that moment was this. What do I say to my colleagues of all racial and ethnic backgrounds about how to productively move forward after the brutal murder of George Floyd that we had all just witnessed a few days before? I had to think creatively about how to convey what so many black architects were feeling in that deeply troubling time, while also giving everyone a sense of hope for a brighter future. That is when I penned what would have become, or what was my most notable message as NOMA president. I found the courage to step out of my comfort zone and become somewhat vulnerable in expressing how I felt about what was happening. Ultimately, I challenged all of us to be brave. Now, I love a good acronym, as you may have gathered. Um, so brave, of course, means me more than just the word brave. Um, so I'll share a brief excerpt from my message from May 31st, 2020. Brave, uh, we must all leverage our positions of privilege to help our most vulnerable citizens, neighbors and colleagues strive for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I urge you to consider what's happening right now as an American problem that we must all face together. Can we collectively be all in for NOMA, which is another acronym I won't go into. But more importantly, can we all be brave, as in committing ourselves to the list of items below for which the following acronym, acronym stands. B, banish racism. R, reach out to those who are grieving. A, advocate for the disinherited. V, vote in every American election. And E, engage each human you meet as you would want to be engaged. If we can promote these basic ideas in our firms, our organizations, and in our communities, our nation will be better for it. Perhaps then, we can all breathe a little easier. Only then can we target our energy and creativity towards designing a better wor world for all in solidarity, Kim. So from this call to action, we saw NOMA's membership grow, as was mentioned, significantly. Uh, by the end of my two-year term in office, NOMA's membership had grown by over 270%. While I'm no longer serving on the board, I had the opportunity to dial into a virtual NOMA town hall meeting last Friday, 
and I was so proud of the work that NOMA, the NOMA team continues to do consistently advancing NOMA's mission, which we also voted to, uh, to change on May 31st, 2020. And that mission is rooted in a rich legacy of activism is to empower our local chapters and membership to foster justice and equity in communities of color through outreach, community advocacy, professional development, and design excellence. So at this point, I've shared some stories that have hopefully underscored the importance of curiosity, creativity, courage, and consistency. As I prepare to conclude my remarks today, I wish to share how I foresee, yes, the four C's, my future as the 100th president of the American Institute of Architects in 2024. Let me back up a little bit in order to go forward to the future. Early last year, I was strongly encouraged to run for the AIA presidency. This can largely be attributed to my success at the home of NOMA that I just described. That is essentially how I got here. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I said that out loud. The next big question, or curiosity, is what will I do with this incredible platform? In other words, how can I best represent the profession of architecture during my single year of office, single year in office leading the AIA? Thinking creatively, I'd like to revisit my roots from 1994, Kim. I want to help people. I want to help create better health outcomes for the people around me. The primary duty of an architect is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. That was one statement that was prominently featured on the licensure exam. So it is really important, yet it somehow doesn't get a lot of airtime in public. One thing that I intend to do as AIA president is courageously advocate for the value of design. I plan to ensure that everyone not only knows the AI mission, which is to inspire and empower architects to improve society and transform the world, but, the, but that designers from all disciplines, including everyone sitting here, can join us in this vital work. Whether you're planning to pursue a career in architecture, real estate, urban design, planning, engineering, landscape architecture, or something else, I need for each of you to commit to creating a better and healthier world ahead. For the first time in 100 years, the US life expectancy numbers recently went down from 79 years of age in 2019 to 76 years of age in 2021. Of course, COVID-19 drove this troubling stat, but it also shed light on where people are most vulnerable. I've lived in Chicago for the past four years and was astounded to learn that in 2019, the average life expectancy on the north side of Chicago, which is predominantly white, is 90 years. Yet, on the south side of Chicago, which is predominantly, pla predominantly black, the average life expectancy is 60 years. We are talking about a 30-year life gap. That is something that we need to rally around as a society, all of us. Not only shall we curiously question how this came to be, but we must creatively and courageously solve this inequity. Not just in Chicago, but anywhere in the world where one person's address determines that their life is not scheduled to be as long as another's. This is where I challenge all of us to design for life. Addressing these types of disparities will not happen overnight, but I urge you to work on them and to keep showing up. Be consistent. So again, I welcome you to the world ahead. We need you to foresee the future and design a better one for all of us. Thank you and congratulations to the class of 2023.